This is a course of lectures and discussions on economics. It seems right to round off these sessions by considering the part ethics can or should play in economics. As part of its project of making itself value free, economics progressively expelled ethics from its subject matter, put ethics, morals beyond limits. They were outside the model. And this exclusion has rightly been resisted by many economists. We surely want to be able to say about this set of economic arrangements or that particular economic policy, this is good or this is bad. But economics doesn't allow us to ask those questions. They only really allow us to ask, is this efficient? Is this an efficient way of doing it? Whatever it is we have to do. Questions about ends are simply shunted to some other field of study. And so we must try and bring ethics back into our discussion of economics. But I want to leave you with this, I think, rather serious question. What moral tools do we have, or perhaps I should say do we have left, for making moral judgments about economic life? Chicago University economist George Stigler, who was also a Nobel laureate, proclaimed, the economist doesn't need ethics, only arithmetic. His task is to clear up social mistakes. And to make sure we got the point, mathematics has no symbols for confused ideas. Promoting its value-free status, Lionel Robbins famously defined economics in 1932 as the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. And this has been accepted as the working definition of economics ever since. Economics is about the logic of choice under scarcity. The Robbins definition superseded the earlier view of economics as a study of the causes of material wealth, or as Alfred Marshall put it, of the material prerequisites of well-being. Robbins pointed out that it is not the materiality but the scarcity of goods which makes them economic. Every decision involving choice of means has an economic aspect. In saying this, Robbins expanded the analytic power of economics, but at the expense of its moral compass. For the preoccupation of the earlier generation of thinkers was precisely about the relationship between material wealth and ethical good, it was John Stuart Mill, for example, who first raised the question, how much is enough? The title of a book I wrote with my son. The Robin's terrain is stripped of such extraneous moral clutter. His economics presents us with self-interested individuals, denuded of social ties, but with infinitely varied wants, facing budget constraints, which prevent them from realizing all their wants simultaneously. Therefore, they have to economize. Economics is about the logic of such economizing. Whether the model is intended to describe how people actually behave or how they should behave is beside the point here. Either way, no ethics is involved, only arithmetic. Economics is neutral about ends. If people's desires shift from good goods to bad goods, this simply registers as a shift in demand schedules. And all economics asks of means is that they be efficient, that preferences should be transitive. Now, all of this represented a considerable reversal of earlier thinking about the economy. Uh, after all, scientific economics grew up uh, out of a collapsing medieval order. At the heart of pre-modern thought stood the question of value of what is worthy or unworthy of admiration or esteem, more simply, what is good and what is bad. Economics was part of that inquiry, but it had one decisive advantage in discussing goods and bads, which is that the value of material goods could be made commensurable. Their costs and benefits could be precisely stated on a single scale of money. So questions of value for this class of goods were from the start stated in terms of prices. Even so, the prices of economic goods were supposed to reflect the place of these goods in the moral universe. 
and were explained by reference to it. What we find as economics matures is that moral content of market prices is dropped. Discussion about the relationship of value to price is collapsed into value-free arithmetic. And so what I want to do is to outline four topics in economics which have undergone the reductive process. The idea of the just price, the stewardship concept of private property, the morality of means and the morality of ends. I conclude with whether there's still space left for ethics in economics. It's not enough to call for the re reinsertion of moral values into economics. The question today is whether we possess an ethics powerful enough to dethrone arithmetic and overcome the social mistakes of economists. Let's first consider the idea of the just price, one of the oldest concepts of value in economics. It has a joint empirical moral pedigree, this, the notion of the just price. On the one side, it's an explanation of why things cost what they do. On the other side, it's a theory of what things should cost, the just price. The just price is the price that does justice to the efforts of producers and the needs of consumers. It was based on a moral code designed to prevent people exploiting each other. Just price doctrines, of course, go back to Aristotle and were elaborated by medieval, the medieval schoolmen. They had their basis in divine or natural law. The just price is a measure of a fair transaction. In pre-modern economic thinking, and I think this is very important, the just price was roughly equated with the customary price. The customary price was a ready reckoner of what societies believed was fair dealing. Why did that shift? I think a couple of things. First of all, the great inflation of the 16th and 17th centuries and the spread of international commerce resulted in, in, in market prices becoming seriously detached from customary prices which is a way of saying that the customary economy shrank relative to the market economy. I mean, that was part of the whole modernize, modernize, modernizing process. Now, let's look at a particular just price, the labor theory of value. This was a secular distillation of just price doctrine. The classical economists, the French physiocrats, and Adam Smith and his followers, distinguished productive from unproductive labor. The labor theory, of uh, labor theory of value was intended to isolate that part of price which wasn't value, but represented rent. Economic rent was a price that had no basis in real cost, but was purely a free lunch for the owners of land and money. The classic medieval unjust price was usury taking interest on loans. Why was it unjust? Because it, see, it was seen as making money from money. Lending out money for which you had no use cost nothing and was therefore not entitled to a reward. Adam Smith and David Ricardo both accepted labor effort as an explanation of long-run normal prices in contradiction to market prices which fluctuated around them. That is, they distinguished between the natural price, the price of labor effort, and the market price. Adam Smith posed the famous diamond water paradox. Why were diamonds so expensive and water so cheap when diamonds were useless and water was vital? Smith found the answer in the difficulty and expense of getting them from the mine from which he concluded that what everything really costs to the man who wishes to possess it is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. Well, that was the simple labor theory of value, and then it developed complications. Surely the, the labor of the capitalist also deserved to be rewarded. Ricardo incorporated the reward to the capitalist in the labor theory of value by treating capital as stored-up labor. 
capital comes into existence through the abstinence or saving of the capitalist. The saving of the capitalist adds value to the painful exertions of labor. In Ricardo's hands, the labor theory of value becomes a cost of production theory. It has one root in the medieval idea of the just price, but it also seeks to give a certain moral grandeur to self-interest. By investing it with a particular virtue, the sacrifice of present for future consumption. Thus profit could be seen as the just reward for sacrifice. Much later came the idea of profit as a reward for risk-taking, for enterprise. And that's, I think, where you come to the modern theory. Now, Karl Marx had a different agenda. He adopted the labor theory of value not to justify the profits of the capitalist class, but to remove the capitalist class from the value equation. The capitalist profit has nothing to do with his abstention from, from consumption, everything to do with his abstention from work. It arises from the capitalist being able to extract surplus value from the worker. The worker, say, paid five hours worth of goods for eight hours worth of work. And the difference constitutes the capitalist's rent or unearned income, or in Marxist terms, the exploitation of labor. The exploitation is made possible by the capitalist owning all the machines, leaving the worker with nothing to sell but his labor power. So it's a classic unjust bargain with the worker having to accept whatever wage he's offered or, or on pain of starvation. Well, the problem facing all these cost of production theories was that, that the prices which goods fetched in rapidly expanding and increasingly deregulated markets had little relation to the hours of labor spent in producing them. The long run or normal or natural price obstinately failed to emerge from the ever-expanding web of exchange relations. The price system seemed to lack a moral anchor. A theory of value which couldn't explain actual price, price behavior was obviously somewhat deficient. And, and from the 1870s, the cost of production theory was swept aside um, and it was replaced by a supply and demand theory in which market prices were jointly determined by scarcity and consumer demand. Adam Smith had explained the high price of diamonds by the cost and difficulty of getting them out of the mine. But as an astute critic pointed out at the time using a different example, pearls don't fetch a high price because people die for them. People die for them because they fetch a high price. The solution to the diamond water paradox came in two bites known as the marginalist revolution. The first was the abolition of any distinction between wants and needs. Both were subsumed in the idea of subjective utility. Different goods gave people different intensities of pleasure, and their prices measured the degree of pleasure or utility they offered, as well as their relative scarcity. In ordinary language, what people pay for something depends on how much they want it and how scarce it is. People may want something, but it has no price unless it's scarce. Water is normally a free good, or it was considered such then, but of course it acquires a price in the desert. The second step in the marginist revolution was to say that prices are determined at the margin. It was Jevons who united the concept of subjective utility with a differential calculus. It's not total pleasure that we wish to measure, but the pleasure of having a little more. Utility is maximized when the pleasure of having a little more is equalized across alternative uses. Jevons predicted that numerical determination of the laws of utility would turn economics into a science, on a par with natural science. Now, marginalism knocked out the labor cost of production explanation of prices. Labor couldn't be regarded as the source of value because the labor spent on producing a, con a commodity was gone and lost forever. Therefore, it could have no influence on the price which an article would fetch when brought to market. Wages were an effect, not a cause of the value of the product. Well, this was a scientific triumph, wasn't it? 
It explained or explained away many puzzles in the older theory of value, such as the high price of rare painting. It knocked away the foundation of the Marxist exploitation theory. I leave to one side its own scientific problems, such as its inability to measure intensities of pleasure. More serious in the context of our discussion was the loss of the moral sense of value. Value depends entirely on individual anticipations of pleasure from goods in short supply. There's no appeal beyond the market price. Market prices can only be unjust if competition is restricted by monopoly. The normative goal of mainstream economic policy follows, which is to make markets ever more competitive. Now, it's very interesting to note, I think, that economics couldn't entirely shed its intellectual legacy. Its continued commitment to equilibrium or natural price models of economic life is unacknowledged homage to its earlier entanglement with just price theories. The word natural still runs through economics. Concepts like the natural rate of unemployment, the natural rate of interest. These are ghosts of earlier real cost theories of value. Now I come to my second topic, the expulsion of private property as stewardship. That private property is the moral Achilles heel of the capitalist system was recognized by Locke nearly 400 years ago. In his uh, two treatises on government, this is in 1689, Locke says that everyone has a natural right to property in his own labor, that is, to such fruits of the earth as his own labor brings forth. How can this be reconciled with the fact that most land is owned by a minority of proprietors? Locke argued that unequal property was the deserved reward of superior effort. Much later came the flowering of the utilitarian argument that inequality increases productivity. I mean, that comes much later, but you can see how, how, how the argument is, is evolving. And that later argument was the core belief of the su supply-side economics of uh, Reagan and Thatcher. Make society more unequal, you will get greater productivity and therefore a greater growth in wealth or GDP. Locke himself kept alive the connection to older concepts of just property holdings by arguing that owners who left their land or capital idle should be dispossessed of it, since nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy. To own property was to hold it in trust for the general good. Good landlords were stewards, Thus, private ownership, if used for the general good, need not abrogate people's natural right to property in their own labor. In the Industrial Age, workers claimed a right to work as an equivalent to a right to property ownership. The right to work was a very important demand for all labor movements everywhere. But neoclassical economics evaded this claim by assuming full employment. Sufficiently flexible labor markets would guarantee everyone who wanted it a job. Unemployment was assumed to be a choice for leisure, carrying with it no right of income. Workers also claimed a fair share of the product which they and the capitalists uh, jointly produced. Marx, as we've seen, denied this was possible under capitalism. Left-leaning neoclassical economists like Arthur Pigou tried to establish a scientific basis for income redistribution. The diminishing marginal utility of money, Pigou argued, justified transferring money from the rich to the poor. But this effort foundered on the impossibility of measuring intensities of satisfaction. It became accepted doctrine that no social welfare function could be derived from interpersonal comparisons of utility. After this failed attempt, to develop uh, a, a redistributionary, um, a redistributionary um, economics, mainstream economics simply gave up on the question of the justice of distribution. Instead, proofs were supplied that in a perfectly competitive market, all the factors of production receive their marginal products. 
This took distribution off the economic agenda, though not, of course, off the political agenda, but it was outside scientific economics. The question of the justice of property rights is currently much more discussed by philosophers than by economists. For example, John Rawls, Rawls' social welfare function based on the thought experiment of the veil of ignorance, is clearly derived from Locke. Stewardship theories of property flourish in the notion of stakeholder capitalism. But the concept of stewardship has no echo in mainstream economics because it challenges the idea that markets in the factors of production are or can be made perfectly efficient. Now, the moral debate isn't one-sided. I don't want to just say all the arguments are on, on the side of, of, of redis redistributing property. There's, of course, an efficiency argument for well-specified and legally enforceable property rights. The idea that property is held on trust undermines the classical liberal defense of private property as a barrier to arbitrary state action. There's also a liberal argument for the state not interfering in the voluntary contracts of employers and workers. All I'm really asking is that students of economics sh should, should um, be conscious of, of the moral and political choices implied by their analytic choices. Now I come to the expulsion of moral discussion of means, my, my third topic. And this has many ramifications, including how bosses should treat workers, of course. I just want to highlight one um, issue, the disappearance of the moral concept of the cost of progress. The shift from a static to dynamic economy in the 19th century um, was accompanied by furious denunciation of its moral costs by no one more eloquently than Karl Marx. And I quote from the Communist Manifesto, constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation, all fixed, fast-frozen relationships are swept away. All that is solid melts into air. Wonderfully eloquent passage and, and you know, obviously resonates everywhere. Duncan Foley, who's at the New School, has written, the moral fallacy of Adam Smith's position is that it urges us to accept direct and concrete evil in order that indirect and abstract good may come of it. He raises a question which shouldn't be evaded. How much suffering is justified to end suffering? Mainstream economics accepts that progress has a price, but nearly all economists will say that the price is worth paying. If the critic points out the wrenching costs of continuous adjustment to new conditions, the economist will invite us to consider how much better most people live today than they did before the Industrial Revolution. In the 19th century, James Mill put the case in a way that wouldn't seem out of place today. The free enterprise system has its hardships, but it is the price we pay for progress and the general good. His son, John Stuart Mill, unable so confidently to excuse the suffering of others, added the proviso that this suffering would surely be temporary. As wealth advanced, suffering would ease. Herbert Spencer added a Darwinist twist. The sufferings of the poor were the mechanism through which society thrived. Only by rewarding the rich and punishing the poor would it continue to do so. Keynes went further. Capitalism was the price we have to pay for progress. Capitalism's psychological mainstream, love of money, is ethically bad, but it is the means to the good. By creating abundance, it will enable future generations to live wisely and agreeably and well. Capitalism was a passing phase, a view actually Keynes shared with Marx. Most economists can't imagine a post-capitalist era because they see scarcity as a permanent condition. The Robbins definition sets no limit to human wants. Scarcity demands arithmetical, not moral solutions. Further, capitalism has shown itself superior to communism as a growth engine, 
because central planning couldn't do the arithmetic, an argument we owe to Hayek, of course. Then there was Joseph Schumpeter, who said, never waste a good recession. He was the apostle of wealth creation through creative destruction. Progress was not a smooth evolutionary path, but a chaotic one in which moribund giants are constantly being replaced by agile upstarts through a succession of crises. This is a concept that modern-day Silicon Valley has embraced enthusiastically under the slightly softer label of disruptive innovation. For Schumpeter, creative destruction is the way the capitalist system works. He would have said that it creates more value than it destroys. The same reply is given by all techno-enthusiasts. To be sure, they say, automation will destroy many existing jobs and ways of life, but in the long run, everyone will benefit, the long run. And so you won't find any serious discussion of the moral cost of progress in standard economic textbooks, at least I haven't found them. The analytic language itself neutralizes the inquiry. The costs of progress are segregated into a sort of corner called the short run or the transition. Efficient markets will ensure that these short run and or transitional periods are temporary. A neoclassical economist will argue that the compensation principle was invented precisely to reduce the costs of progress. Provided the gainers can compensate the losers, then markets will be Pareto efficient. But this assumes wrongly that gains and losses can be measured on a single money scale. It also abstracts from the problem of the politics needed to bring about this compensation in practice. With rare exceptions, all those who concede that economic progress has a price beg the question of what is economic growth for? Is it to make us richer, happier, or better? And what's the connection between these terms? This brings me to my fourth topic, which is exit the morality of ends. Now, I start with a quote from Keynes. The growth of the cake became the object of true religion. In this ironic summary, Keynes implied that the means, the growth of the cake, had preempted the ethical question, what is economic growth for? The answer which most of us would give on reflection is so to reduce physical scarcity that most people can lead better lives. Economists are in tune with the popular feeling in seeing that material adequacy is necessary for a good life. But those who question growth of GDP as the object of true religion have also been struck by the fact that beyond a certain income level, the average of happiness or sense of well-being seems not to increase proportionately. This has prompted them to query the continuing organization of society to maximize economic growth. The ethics of the matter seem clear enough. Economic growth should stop at the point when further growth no longer produces a net improvement in the quality of life. And here you obviously vast differences in the application of this principle to developed countries and, or, and developing countries. I mean, take that, that is obviously the case. But then, you know, just taking, for instance, the stage we have reached in most Western countries, the argument starts with what we mean by good quality of life. To most economists, and it has to be said to many others, the answer is a happy life. This is in line with the utilitarian ethics of most economists who accept the Benthamite goal of maximizing the quantity of pleasure and minimizing the quantity of pain. So a good life is what makes people happy or at least less miserable. Thus economics reduces the issue of quality to one of quantity. Quantity can be measured. The chief measure of national quantity is gross domestic product. GDP is the sum of, all, of the annual market value of all final goods and services. The aim of governments all around the world is to increase the size of GDP. But GDP measures what can be measured, not what should be measured. It leaves out good non-marketed activities and includes bad marketed activities. Labor that goes into volunteering, housework, 
child rearing and many other things is uncosted and therefore not part of GDP, while the costs of crime, pollution, resource depletion and so on add to GDP. It's a crazy, crazy way of measuring uh, well-being. Economists who understand the weakness of GDP as a measure of quality have suggested alternative indexes. The Human Development Index, for example, includes indicators of a country's nutrition, education and health. Quite right. The OECD's Better Life Index contains 11 components. The King of Bhutan says that gross national happiness should be the aim of economic policy. However, because these hybrid indexes mix up incommensurables, they can't be reduced to a single number. Ethical choices still have to be made. For example, does an increase in leisure add to or subtract from well-being? Stuck with the notion of the sovereign consumer, mainstream economics has no way of subjecting consumer desires to uh, critical scrutiny. Committed to the doctrine of the rational consumer, it is cut off from considering the degree to which consumer choice is manipulated by advertising. Moreover, in postulating that our desires are insatiable, it sets up an eventually insoluble conflict between its conception of human nature and physical nature. Limitless wants confront the law of entropy. But a moral critique of insatiability is outside the scope of scientific economics, which takes preferences as given. So, I come to my conclusion. Back from arithmetic to ethics, question mark. The Stigler-Robbins program of, of, of expelling ethics from economics, so as to make it more scientific, was always a forlorn hope. It breaks down on the weakness of economics as a science, as compared to the natural sciences. Given the near impossibility of establishing empirically robust laws of human behavior, its scientific core has come to consist of logical mathematical deductions from tight, unrealistic priors. It can't escape what Keynes called introspection and judgments of value, but it buries them in logical deductivist methodology. This makes large parts of economics useless as a picture of the world and positively misleading as a source of policy. Almost all the ethical questions I've been raising come from outside economics. This is an excellent argument for making moral and political philosophy, history, sociology, anthropology, many adjacent disciplines, part of the training of an economist. As John Stuart Mill said, a man, he, they use, always use the word man in the 19th century, a man can't be a good economist who's only an economist. However, in trying to reconnect economics uh, to ethics, we have to face honestly the question of whether contemporary ethics can deliver the robust moral judgments we're looking for, both as regards means and as regards ends. There are two main grounds for skepticism. The first is the collapse in the West of the religious foundation of ethics. Secular ethics are fragments of older religious beliefs which lack the support of religion. And the second factor which makes it difficult to, to, to reinsert ethics into economics is the diminishing importance of custom. If religion and custom are no longer s secure indicators of moral worth, we're left with little but faith in the good sense of, of individuals. In practice, there's been a steady convergence of economic theory and moral philosophy on the idea of the individual, on individualism. Just as the market economy replaced the customary economy, so the claims of individual rights have largely re replaced those of social obligation. Both economics and political philosophy take individual preferences as data. The convergence is made concrete with shopping as the unifying sort of metaphor, really, of, of, of modern society. We shop around for lifestyles, 
We shop around for everything, finding in consumption ever new sources of identity. And this is the way, you know, this is the way the argument runs at the moment. The one still universally accepted moral constraint on our choices is the harm criterion. We no longer expect our choices to be good because we don't agree about what is good, but we expect them to avoid harming others and to some extent harming ourselves. This is, of course, a powerful constraint on bad behavior. But it is hard to agree on what is a moral as opposed to a physical harm without prior agreement on what is morally good. And that's exactly what it's so hard to come by. Keynes found a moral basis for economics in the prospect for the good life which economic and especially technological progress was opening up. But he had a very clear conception of what the good life was and he thought it was grounded in universal moral intuitions. But he was referring back to the existence of a moral community which in his youth, the end of the 19th century, was still taken for granted. Now, I'm not denying that today we have moral communities uh, which pursue their own visions of the good, but there's no moral consensus about what is good. So there is reason to doubt whether the moral resources which still exist in Western societies are powerful enough to challenge the laws of arithmetic and correct the social mistakes of economists.